So as is the custom with uh, Tu Desi Tu Queer, we'll have an ex exploration and a talk afterwards about the films, but also about mental well-being, which is very important for our community. Uh, and particularly at this time, uh, our mental well-being has been challenged over the last uh, year and a half at least, uh, and we continue to be challenged. But um, obviously as queer communities, we are particularly have a particular set of challenges which may be different from other communities. So um, first of all, I thought I could ask each of you to introduce yourselves and just talk a bit about what you do and the work you've been doing. Rita, would you like to start? Okay. Hi, I'm Rita, uh, co-founder of Club Kali, which was set up 26 years ago now. Um, long time. I set it up with DJ Ritu uh, because we felt there wasn't a space for LGBTQ people who are of South Asian heritage or descent. And so we set up Club Kali. There was another club night running, a disco called Shakti. So Club Kali was largely an inspiration of Shakti. But there was a difference in that um, I, when I moved to London, I didn't feel that it was a particularly safe space because of my work in domestic violence, etc., etc. So anyway. Um, given my background, I decided Club Kali was going to be it with uh, quite a feminist edge, hence the name, you know, goddess fears, challenging everything. Um, and that's how it was set up. So it was set up as a club night, safe space for dancing, because I loved dancing. Um, and it became a global community, and I had no idea what would evolve. But essentially, what happened was people from various diverse communities came together. We formed one big family. Um, and yeah, it didn't matter what faith you were from, whether you were white, Asian, etc. But Bollywood, the music united us and our LGBTQ identity, and also the food and the flowers and the welcome and all the all things Asian um, that I grew up with that I completely rejected. I reclaimed <laughs> and created it, recreated it at Club Kali, but. So that's me, and my, my other work is working in domestic violence um, with refuge, women's aid, etc., but also LGBT domestic violence, which is a very new area. So that's me. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Sana? Thank you. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Sana. Um, yeah, I'm a, I'm a clinical psychologist most of the time. I'm also a poet. Um, yeah, my work, my work as a psychologist takes lots of different forms at the moment. Um, I'm working to, to decolonize um, the clinical psychology program. So yeah, I don't know if, if any of you are, are, are kind of aware of whiteness in the profession of clinical psychology, but it's an 88% white profession at the moment. So part of my work is really about trying to diversify the curriculum, the program, the training module, um, and yeah, so that, that's kind of more my full-time work. And I think a big part of that is, of course, working with, with marginalized communities, really, in terms of the liberation within the therapy room, but also redefining what we understand as healing, as, as not just kind of very Western um, medicalized ideas of therapy that are very much just belong in the therapy room, uh, but thinking about that in a wider context. Um, and of course, queer communities are part of that. And I think um, my work as a poet is, is really much more personal to me, I mean, in, in different ways. Uh, but I'm, I'm writing my first book at the moment, which is really exciting, my first poetry collection. And yeah, that's, that's very much exploring the themes of queerness and Islam um, and trauma and psychology. Um, and I hope, yeah, I think I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward to, to putting that out there and hopefully that, that, that offers some resonance and a place for people to find some sense of belonging through, through sharing those poems. Um, so yeah, that's a bit about me. Thank you. Thanks. Pavan? Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Pavan Joshi. Um, before I say who I am, uh, I am actually really touched by joining this panel and the courageous stories I have known and heard about you, but also be part of, actually. So I remember Club Kali and joined Sena, Sena in different panels as well. Um, my professional background, I am a psychiatrist, um, so I work in the similar field, uh, but psychiatrists actually prescribe medications, just kind of a, a slight difference, because many people, I think, are still trying to understand what is the difference between psychology and psychiatry. So I'm trained uh, a psychiatrist, but I have a, me a medical background. So I was trained in India, 
uh, in medical. Uh, and then the story is actually, I fell in love with a straight guy, and, and, but couldn't tolerate that because uh, when they said that uh, this is not for me, I, I felt broken hearted, uh, came to the UK. Um, so that's actually a big part of my story. And then moved towards mental health because that spoke quite a lot because that time of uh, breakup, not breakup actually, was a not acceptance, uh, running away, trying to fight myself, actually naturally moved me towards mental health. So that's how the journey became. I just want to mention in last couple of years, things have really positively looked towards, well, happened to, for me. And also what I'm noticing for a large LGBT community, thanks to all the work you guys have done and doing, and also the people like uh, here, um, we know Neeraj, who is actually part of uh, Lotus um, uh, kind of a film group, uh, Joshi, who has set up a Jin group, which I am, I have to say, a proud member of. And I just want to share the story of Jin, actually, about two years ago when Jin was established and Joshi mentioned uh, that this is what I'm tr thinking of doing, I felt great. Because one of the things which I was struggling to f come to terms with was when I think about my identity, I think for me, South Asian identity and, and a, uh, LGBT identity was quite interconnected. And I couldn't find a space where it's all mixed up and I could be seen as a whole, uh, and again, there we have different layers of our identity, but those two layers were so important. And when Jin actually came, came in the scene, I said, well, I want to jump on the ship as well, and let's see where we sail through. And we did sail through, and thanks to Joshi and all the people who have worked for, we, we started with 20 members, now we have 1,200 members, part of Meetup, and, and there's so much work Jin is doing, from uh, book clubs to movie clubs, and, and part of this work as well. So, a really proud member and privileged member of, of uh, that organization as well. Great. So that's just a little bit of about me. Thank you. Thank, Thank you for having me. Great. Um, so um, obviously we're talking about mental well-being. Thank you for those, for those uh, um, that knowledge about each of you. Um, I wondered uh, what references or resonances the films brought up for you. They've, obviously Stray Dogs is a very strong and very challenging film at the end, but we've also seen many joyous moments in the films as well. I just wondered if you had particular films or particular things that came out from you from these films that talked about mental well-being or, or related to experiences that you'd um, could it identify with, for example. Rita, would you like to start off with anything? Where do you want me to start? <laughs> <laughs> I have to say, fantastic range of films, and I think every film resonated with me in so many different ways. I honestly could talk about it all night, but I will pick one. Um, I think they, the, I think mental health and well-being is so complex and so layered, um, and often when we talk about it, it's about things that are wrong, um, where we need to get help. But I think um, I know her resonated because I think we have to have lighter moments as well, particularly given the time that we've been through lockdown, COVID, etc. cetera. And um, although we have the downs, and I've seen a lot of those at Club Carly when people turn to me and talk about all the stuff that they're going through and, and we, we try and support them, when the, the kind of the final line of, you know, that's my mom, I was thinking that is just so what happens at Club Carly. There are so many stories in there. People are like um, saying, oh, can you find me a match? And be honest to God, it like happens. Can you find me a match? And I introduce person A to person B and oh my God, I can't go out with them. That person knows my mom, so and so, so and so's daughters, fathers, sisters, shopkeepers, neighbor or something like that. And I think, I think you know, as a community that that's, that resonated with me and I think we have to have laughter, we have to have joy during these times and that's about validating who we are as well and sometimes we forget that. So for me, giving the space that we create at Club Carly as well, I think it's the upbeat and um, yeah, joy, joy and love, it, it has to be. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, I love that one. It's so, so good. Yeah, definitely one of my favorites. I think it's interesting because I am um, what I was thinking about. I kind of took a different lens on that film. Um, but yeah, there were so many that, that resonated. Uh, so it's really hard to kind of pick which to talk about. So thank you for, sh for just selecting such incredible films. Um, yeah, I think I think that how we navigate 
that proximity to each other um, and, and that real longing for connection, which I think comes through all of the films, this real desperation for connection and for belonging. And, and I think um, when we think about community as queer, dizzy people, queer people of color, you know, we have to navigate this proximity while we have this desperate, this desperate sense of, of longing for belonging and also a lot of trauma that comes, that we were all carrying and, and perhaps even maybe experiences of rejection or exile from our own families, right? And then we're, we're, we're turning to our communities or into intimate relationships, you know, with this real, like, I don't know, just hope for something different, for something more loving, you know? And sometimes actually met with a lot of pain in the place of that. And I think I, think I was thinking about that proximity in, 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 you know, in I Know Her, where how we navigate, you know, our hopes for intimacy and connection, whilst, whilst the messiness of, hu of humanness, and um, yeah, how hard that is, how hard that is to, to maintain community lovingly, whilst also navigating that, that complexity and looking after ourselves and looking after each other and, and yeah, managing that. Um, so that, that really spoke to me. I, I think as well, um, I think it's compartment. I loved, I really, really loved um, what, what that, I think what that film shows is how desperately we need to see ourselves in each other, you know, how, how, how modeling just holds so much for us, you know, just to imagine more who we can be. And I think it really captures that kind of navigating the possibilities of who we, who we long to be, who we want to be, versus who we think, you know, the only, the only way we might be accepted, right? And, I, and, I, and I'm, I'm always, that, that kind of, that contradiction or that, that place where we get stuck sometimes, I think, I think that's where we carry a lot of our pain. You know, and, and when, when it comes to the conversation of well-being, you know, I think, I think it's carrying that, that, that we have a lot of pain, but also the possibility of joy, you know. So, yeah, sorry, I could talk a lot, That's so I'm mindful. That's good. That's good. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Pavan, any particular favourites? Um, I think I like the diversity of the movies you chose. I, I was so kind of, I noticed myself moving into different feelings and themes as each particular story. I was actually quite impressed with the, the selection, the diversity, but also the timing of it, the different nuances and different stories, actually. I think the, the story wig was quite actually uh, powerful for me. And I think one of the things why it was powerful is that because it breaks the barrier of uh, that uh, LGBT community were, and them, and, and on the other side, actually, them and, and straight people with LGBT community and so on. And I think w there were so many kind of messages in that movie. An independent woman who is actually standing up in a society which is not give has given traditionally the space for and, ho and imagining herself as a quite a, a independent, um, strong woman, but gets irritated when somebody downstairs actually makes a complaint for spilling the water. What actually happened later on, she encounters a transgender woman um, and the courage and inspiration moves her and I noticed the small subtle change. The next time she's watering the plant, it's being done so subtly. And that's the message here. Once we open our eyes and we see the journey of other people, the barriers come down. And I just wanted to touch on one thing, actually, which I have noticed quite often, which I think Senna spoke to um, about is actually the trauma and pain. We do carry trauma and pain. But what does that do to us? And what I notice what that does to me or what has done to me is actually it created the unspoken anger. It created unspoken confusion. And that confusion and anger is, becomes a barrier. I get triggered more often than those people who had, let's say, secure attachment are more accepted families. And it's only now I have started to begin to understand that actually those subtle triggers are still in me. What that triggers does, that when I approach to other people, I perceive their reactions, even when they didn't mean to, those kind of reactions. And that is the barrier which we need to break. 
What I mean how we break it is that to be aware of that, that we have had a courageous, brave journey to be where we are, considering where we have come from, but they have left some sensitivity and, and, and traumas, little sensitive traumas which are not very visible. So whenever we come into interactions with people which seems a threat or, or attack, let's just hold ourselves because our past traumas are triggering us with the subtle nuances as well. Can we just hold that pain and reach out to other person and then things start to move? Because once we sit down on, around the table, open and open a dialogue, things move. And that's what the message I got from so many of these beautiful movies. Thanks for selection. Thanks for our amazing selection. Thank you. Sana, Sana you used to say something? Yeah, no, I was just going to say no. Thank you so much for highlighting, I think, this this sort of threat detection state that I think some of us can be in, and, and really understandably, because we have experienced so much trauma and the world is a traumatizing place for us and we do have to be hypervigilant because it often isn't safe. So we, of course, like we are in that place, but it, again, I think it's just what you were saying about how can we meet that compassionately? You know, how can we hold ourselves for just a minute to be, to be soft with ourselves for that? You know, I think it's, um, it's really difficult because I think, I think sometimes what we can do, often because many of us, you know, I don't, and I don't mean to overgeneralize here, but, but may have experienced a, a, um, a lot of criticism in our early lives, right? So we then can, can maybe risk criticizing ourselves for being in that threat place, for being like, oh, you're doing it again, or, you know, and it's kind of like that second arrow of self-criticism. Um, and so it's really, really difficult. So I think it's, there's so much in meeting ourselves with compassion for, for the fact that we, we carry these ways of coping and, and navigating the world. You know, of course, we, we see things as threatening, but how can we slowly create more space to see it differently? And I think compassion really opens us up to do that. Compassion for ourselves, and then, you know, in turn, we open ourselves up to be more compassionate with each other. Um, I think it, it's a really tough road. I mean, what I've observed in the last 25 plus years is that when certainly when we started up the Club Kali space, we grow up and there are absolutely zero role models. We're, we're isolated individual beings going around in our little world. And when we connect with each other, because as all the movies, uh, all the shorts showed, we're constantly constrained. There are rules and regulations and spaces we can inhabit and spaces we can't and the way we behave and the language we use, the way we dress, absolutely A to Z. There's a, you know, a rule and a principle and yeah. So um, at Club Carly, what I, what I kind of felt, the evolution of, of people, because there are people I've known for 25 plus years, um, compassion is really, really difficult. And self-love is, is, is harder than pr pretty much anything. And so what I observed was bad behavior. And when I say bad behavior, I mean that in a healthy way. Because we have to let our hair down. In the absence of reference points, in the absence of how to be LGBT, in the absence of how do we know how to be gay? How do we know how to be queer, lesbian, whatever we call it? We don't know, so we're, we're finding our way. And then we meet these amazing people, like all these people in a club space, get drunk, <laughs> do whatever, and find out, discover. You make mistakes. I mean, many a time I've had to pull people off each other and have a talking to and recommend they go and get talking therapy and get help, and until they've done that, they can't come back. But, you know, I'm, I'm a big fan of talking therapy. I, si I think it's absolutely essential. And the number of people I've, I've said to them, you're banned until you go and get therapy and then come back. Um, it, it's been a life savior for me. Um, and certainly when I did go and see a psychiatrist, I wish you were there, Pavan, because <laughs> I was suddenly told, oh, I'm only a lesbian because I've had bad experiences. And I'm sure that's not uncommon. So, so bad behavior is okay because we need spaces where we can experiment, we can discover ourselves, we can discover what feels good, what doesn't feel good, and we navigate in, in safe spaces to discover who we are, and that's how we do it. And it's really, really important to be kind to ourselves when we make mistakes, 
because that's how we learn. And I think it's after those mistakes and the drama, Bollywood style and all the rest of it, we've, we come to a place of compassion and love because I think it should be from the beginning if we all have healthy upbringings and wonderful you know, society where we don't face discrimination, oppression, prejudice, that would be easy. But for us, it's the, it's the reverse. I think we find it at the end of the road, not the beginning. And that's really sad, but that's been my experience. Yeah, I, th I think you just what you were talking about in terms of what we learn and, and, and role models in the context of that and just there being such an absence of that. And if we think about everything in life as a learning, you know, a lot of the ways that we relate to people are learned in our, our early life. I know you were mentioning attachment, you know, and how, how we see people, how we attach to people is very much about what we've learnt, you know. And I think the reality is if we have learnt repeatedly, you know, to to be in a reactive place or to, to go to a fear place, that becomes practiced, right? The muscle grows. And, and we haven't, you know, even I'm thinking about it's Pride Month at the moment. Everybody talks about pride as if this is something that we're all so familiar with. It's, you know, I mean, f maybe I could speak for myself. I think it's something that is quite unfamiliar. You know, I'm, I'm practicing pride. And it's still a very early practice for me, you know, but I think shame is something that I've, I've learnt, <laughs> you know, and it's embedded and it's in my skin, it's in my body, it's, you know, it's in my tissues. So I think unlearning these things without teachers is incredibly difficult. And I think this is why, you know, your work is so incredibly important because you're holding a space which allows room for some of that messiness, is compassionate in the sense that there's boundaries, right? This harm isn't okay. Go and do the work and you can come back Everybody's human, you can come back, but do the work, and then you can, you know, and that's, that is what I think is how we are learning community, and it's messy, and it, but you know, that's why I think, yeah, Club Carly's work is incredibly important. Can I just come here, Rita? I, I, you are my absolute leader model. 2004 and five, I arrived here, and I was telling how I felt lost, uh, running away from those confusing feelings. I tell my partner that I came out age 26, 27, he, they, he doesn't believe me. I said, well, I grew up in India. There was no role model. There was no language in media. And there was nobody to actually talk about in the society as well. So I was confused. I didn't know. And Kali, Club Kali provided me the space uh, to be myself. And I danced like crazy. <laughs> I still do dance like crazy. <laughs> but uh, I did dance like crazy. And it did give me that expression of energy which was holding inside a space, a, a, a space to just out. But also being in the space of people who I can connect with was hugely important. So, and you're right, actually, we didn't have role models. We work it out in some ways. And the work everybody is doing here, the Bagri Foundation is doing, is Matt and Naz is doing, is Jin is doing, that's incredibly inspiring, that creating a space. And like you said, um, it's about the pride, how we move from that place of trauma and hurt to start owning our story and be proud of our story. Because each of our story made us how unique and individual and wonderful we are. So thanks for creating spaces like, and the work you do, amazing, inspiring. Okay, I mean, in terms of the audience here, I mean, obviously the LGBT community have uh, there's a community uh, and there's uh, like the greater community but how important are many of the films here refer to uh, a community of uh, relationships with a broader Asian LGBT community how important is the relationships we have around the room here in terms of our well-being for example if we're obviously isolation has been a big issue for us over the last um, year and a half in terms of being a lot of many of us who are single have been uh, home alone for a year and a half and those kind of networks those phone calls those or not phone calls or not seeing people how important do you think that's been in terms of people's mental well-being and how can that be preserved for example like all the people that have come here today have obviously come for a reason because we all feel we want to explore our Asian LGBT community or want to explore the Asian LGBT community just could you just tell us a bit about what you think about that as a point in terms of how important that is broader community. Shall I make a start? I think I was looking at the statistics. What happened in the last one and a half years? 
what we were noticing is that LGBT people were finding really difficult to um, access services, mental health services. And majority of them, when they tried, they were not able to get. The problem gets even worse when, the, when we start looking for transgender population. The stats are appalling. Um, mental health services are and should be ashamed to not be inclusive enough to create a space for trans people, but also the other LGBT community as well. So I think we have a long way to go. The COVID had an impact, um, and isolation combined with that had a huge impact. Um, and I, I think one, some of the things, that's where these anchors we were, people were putting the last few years came strongly. So the gin, for example, quite quickly acknowledged that we are being isolated. We are in our houses trapped and nobody to talk to. Lots of people were trapped in the families because previously they may have different spaces to go to and connect with other people, but now they were stuck in the families who didn't accept their identity. And that became more difficult as well. So spaces like Jin, who provided the Sati groups, which was a group for people to come and talk to. It's an open space. You're not judged, you share things in as much as confidential way, and you are welcome to share things, supported people. And there were lots of other organizations started to open up. So where there was gap from mental health services, traditional mental health services, communities came together. And I think this is where I find the strength of South Asian community. Because even if we are LGBT people, we are also South Asian community, and we carry those learning and skills which we have acquired through the being in the community. And I think this is what, I, I don't know what you have said, but I find in, in the Western model, there is a gap there. And what the gap is, what you see in actually in South Asian community, the holding strength of a community. And I think that's where the South Asian community did come, can come, and, and hopefully continue to come. And spaces like this will provide the kind of awareness. And I hope in future we can have wider audience. And I hope in this audience as well, there are people even who don't identify themselves as LGBT, but allies. We need them, actually. And they need us for their growth, because they are missing some of the wonderful growth happening in the LGBT community. Thank you. So now you say. Yeah, yeah, no, thank you so much for sharing. I think you made some really incredible points. I'm, I'm, um, I think in terms of the inaccessibility of mental health services, you know, I mean, that's a whole other, <laughs> we could talk about that for ages. I think what, what sits underneath our need for services in the first place is a, is a desperate sense of longing for connection. And that's something that I was speaking to earlier, you know, when you were talking about how do we manage these periods of, of isolation and when, why is community so important? Well, shame is something, especially I think for, for us as queer people of color that we carry a lot of. And I think shame really breeds in isolation. It's through spaces of connection that shame can actually be alleviated, right? I think sometimes we think that mental health services are the only place that we can find that. And often I think sometimes the way that it stands at the moment, we have 88% white psychologists in mental health services. You know, the psychiatry system can be a very op oppressive one and, and, and psychology too. So I think there's a bit of a myth sometimes that if you come to those services, you will find connection because that's not necessarily the case. Sometimes you will meet a, you know, a white middle class female psychologist who has no idea what you've been through and cannot connect and you have to do the work of explaining right so actually what you know organizations like jin and nazimat who are doing incredible work you know are building community spaces for authentic connection that is more imminent that is actually it, it looks very very different and i think you know there is much more accessibility in those spaces and i think you know there's there's often something that sits with me is, is this idea of survival of the nurtured rather than survival of the fittest. And these, these organizations, where, where do we go to find nurture? We, we find the, the most, you know, I think meaningful nurture is when we turn to each other, you, whether that in spaces like this, in our intimate relationships, in our chosen family, is where we find the most nourishing nurture. I'm not saying that we can't find nurture in mental health services, but I, I, I do think the more we can practice nurture with each other in community, like Nazimat are doing, like Jin are doing, like spaces like this offer these conversations, that's where we can open ourselves up to more healing, you know. Thank you. Rita? Um, 
It was an interesting journey during COVID because one of the things I realized for the people that could reach out and get help, it wasn't great, but there were people who lived independently of their family members who could. But um, we were offering a telephone service and there were people who were calling who were lived, living in their family setup with um, grandparents, parents, siblings. And it was really distressing because what I noticed was there was an increase in addiction to porn, to ordering um, drugs, poppers, stuff like that online, um, gambling. And it, it was really heartbreaking because of that lack of connection. That's why that connection that we've all mentioned is just super, super powerful. But it's also the connection because as South, see, as South Asian people, we have the connection with family members, but that's not always a positive one. So as in terms of our queer identities and the stories I was hearing was, where can I have a safe, accepting connection where I can just be who I am, where I can have that safe space to talk to someone. So the online um, activities that we offered to some degree provided that connection and we enable that to continue. Um, and out of that, because we were referring people to other organizations, that Nazmat and, and Gaysians and some of the other organizations that have been mentioned, but also statutory support systems, um, one of the inspiring things to come out for, for us was to create a community engagement project and bring other organizations together to work smarter so that we can better support our community. So connections is absolutely huge, but I think it has to be safe and accepting. And by that, I mean like, you know, when I've been out there, I, I feel like I don't want to apologize for my Asian-ness. I don't want to have to keep explaining my Asian-ness. Um, I just want to be. And, and that's, that's what's missing. And as you were saying, if you see a white or, an, or a psychiatrist or a professional who doesn't have that diversity awareness, then it's like you spend half your session and paying them to, to actually train them <laughs> and increase their understanding of diversity. And I'm like, I really resent that. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, rather than actually benefiting and having that space to talk about what's bothering you. Mm. So Good point. Good point. Um, I suppose we're running out of time probably, but I um, just wanted to just ask um, if people were here that were obviously possibly triggered about the films, probably there was many really challenging and not op but optimistic films, but um, if people wanted to look at services, uh, would you rec could you recommend key things that you would, key services that you would know of that uh, could help people potentially in the audience or it's being recorded this, uh, this uh, program, so uh, to other people out there that might want services for the future? Yeah, I mean, I, I think it it depends what kind of services. <laughs> I mean, I think places for me, uh, maybe I could speak from my own personal experience where I've found a sense of belonging and connection. Um, I know we sp we've spoken about Nazimat a few times, but I think um, in, for me as a queer Muslim, the Inclusive Mosque Initiative has been incredibly, um, a, an incredibly beautiful space. And um, I I think as well, I mean, I won't go into, just look them up, basically. Um, and I think as well, London Queer Muslims has been, has been a really, really beautiful and healing space. And, um, you know, I think, I think sometimes when, when that question comes, the, the pull is to, to go towards kind of overtly labeled mental health services. But I think it's always, I think what, what that question invites me to do is also think about what we mean by mental health and actually, really underneath it, it's how our suffering shows up and where we can alleviate that suffering in, in whatever form that is. And talking being one of them, but faith may, may be one, you know, sports, drama, whatever it is for you, wh whatever that is that allows connection for you is the space that I would recommend. Go to the places where you find joy as, as, a, space for, as a space for alleviating connection. But yeah, those two are, are places that have, I found a lot of connection in anyway. Yeah. So um, I might have a list of <laughs> things. Um, I think, like you said, Sana, it actually depends the the level of distress mm -hmm. and the 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 kind of the urgency of the kind of mental health service, as well as the intensity of the mental health needs. So, just to kind of give an idea, if somebody is having distressing thoughts, which is going on for weeks, time to see somebody a professional. 
and and I'll talk a little bit about traditional kind of uh, and the mainstream health service because I work in the mainstream NHS work. Um, that's my main work as well. So if somebody is having weeks of distress, uh, which continues, start to affect the daily functioning, um, somebody starts to become more hopeless and stop working the way we're working, then it starts with the GP. That's the first first part of protocol. And now there are more investment being actually put in place in the GP, acknowledging that the mental health services were sitting far away from primary care while the needs were in the primary care. So that's the one way of a route. If there is an emergency, then A&E, all accident emergency departments in the UK have access to liaison service, which are expert of addressing emergency mental health services, which could be self-harm or any trigger thoughts. That's the urgent kind of pathway. With regards to um, other distress, which, which, which is probably going on for a while, but we don't think it's an emergency, we still need some support. So like Sana mentioned, a couple of organizations, but also things like Jin can provide a support, LGBT Foundation, to look up to. Stonewall community has, especially Scotland Stonewall community, if you look at their website, they have a range of LGBT intersectionalities as well. So they would have uh, LGBT, queer, queer LGBT people of color uh, resources. They have actually trans people of color resources. They have LGBT with different abilities people uh, of old age LGBT. So there's a, there's a different kind of resource that you can tap into. So these are just some of those things. Uh, but do look up to these websites. And there's a lot of support out there. And I think the, one of the things actually people touched on as well, one of the difficult parts of illness like depression is it feeds on to shame, but it also then detaches you further because it makes you withdrawing from things as well. So it becomes more difficult to challenge and overcome that shame in, in that time. And there is a role for medication in those times to come out of that intense crisis, maybe not for permanently, but there are some times the medication can help your journey from intense kind of difficult place to move on to the more secure place. And that's just a few things. Sure. Can I just say one thing really quickly? Is that okay? Just because I know that you're, you're, you're a psychiatrist, so you have a, really, a, diff, a, a more medical framework of, of, of um, understanding distress and suffering in terms of, of, you know, I guess, which I think is probably the more embedded framework that we have of understanding distress in, in the UK is one of illness, you know, understanding um, our suffering within the language of disorder and diagnostic terms, which is a very Western and medical framework and quite a Eurocentric one. And I think that is, of course, one way of understanding distress and suffering and one way some people might find some healing in the use of medication or that framework. But there is also, I think, I just want to also suggest that that may not fit for you. You know, it may not fit, that language may not fit for you. The language of disorder may not fit for you. You know, the, the language of pathologization may not fit for you. And that's completely okay. And however your suffering shows up, however, if that's hearing voices, if that is self-harm, that, 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 that I, I guess I, what I'm saying is, is that our suffering shows up in all kinds of ways on a huge spectrum, and it doesn't necessarily have to be medicalized. You know, I totally agree. I, yeah. I think what I was referring that there's range of mental illnesses. Sure. Even within the mental illnesses, we find, I mean, the categorization is one thing. Everybody's journey is unique, but some some actually are mild to kind of moderate level, and there are some very severe. Illnesses. So I was referring to the sev severe aspects of where things have become so difficult that you might need additional support. But I totally agree. I think any mental illness should not be treated on its own by one particular domain because it's not. It's always multifactorial. Mental health is beautiful and complex at the same time. So I think I totally agree that there is a psychological support, social support. And if somebody has, let's say, lost the job, so my medication is not going to treat that unless they find the kind of right support for coming back to get an employment. And there are other things as well. It's just an additional layer of support if things are tough. Uh, that's, but I totally agree with you. There are different, different languages for a different one. I mean, just to say that in terms of obviously the films as well, um, creativity is also a, a version of mental health. Uh, uh, we also, so through our arts and through our 
creativity, we also have good and bad mental health. But what actually we have, uh, the idea of mental health is also not fixed. We think of mental health quite often as a problem, but actually sometimes, you know, they say artists are crazy, but sometimes that actually is positive mental health. It's being different as well. There's, a, there's that aspect of being, using the arts as a kind of creative and a way of healing and understanding and etc. So I think that's perhaps comes through in some of the films that, that people are working through some of their issues in, in a, through a creative medium in the cinema. I have to add that um, in terms of cover, uh, coping, um, I would say talk, talk and talk and never give up talking. Pick up a pen, write a letter to a member of your family and by family I mean a friend who is like your family that you trust, that you feel safe with and not everyone has that um, and if you don't feel like writing a letter, if it doesn't feel safe, then doodle, draw, colour, anything because it's the starting point and we all have to start somewhere and I think until we make that start of talking which is a process which is hugely powerful um, you, you, you know it, it, you can just go downhill so for me it's really really important talking and I would recommend um, 24 hours a day calling the Samaritans they're not necessarily LGBT they may not understand South Asian heritage. You may not have a great person on the other end of the phone, but that doesn't matter because what you've done is you've picked up the phone, you've talked, uttering words about how you feel. That is the point of transition and change and hugely powerful. You'll know this doesn't feel right. That's not what I meant. What did I really want to say? And that process begins. That's the, the hardest, toughest step. So get a pen, write a letter to your family, and yeah, pick up the phone and have a cup of tea. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. That's great. I'm sure the audience want to ask some questions for you, but unfortunately, because of the uh, regulations, we can't actually ask questions in the auditorium. However, I'm sure if you were happy to talk outside of the cinema, we could uh, have a carry the debate on a bit further, if that's okay with you guys. But just, just like to say thank you very much for joining us today, all of you, and uh, for contributing so wonderfully for everything. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.